was 11, 14, 16. You all just did a little brief assessment for me. I am counting that as an assessment because it was looking at, okay, pardon me. Um, I am counting that as an assessment because it's an assessment of whether or not you got that material on Friday when we talked about distributions. If you weren't here, you do need to watch the video on YouTube. So which distribution is this? You can yell this out. Normal. This is a normal distribution. That's what we call it. Sometimes called a bell curve. And I'll just do that. Largest number of individuals in this population for whatever we're measuring exist where? In the middle. And this is usually the, the sort of, it's, so this is the mode. It's the largest number of individuals. It's also usually the arithmetic average. So it's the mean. So in a normal distribution, mean basically equals mode. Approximately. We could say approximately. You know, they might not be identical, but if our mean and our mode are pretty close, that tells us we pretty much have a normal distribution. So what does this say in terms of evolution? So if we've got a population, let's, okay, I love rabbits. There, it's a terrible rabbit, but, you know, let's say that this is the distribution of ear length in a rabbit population. Why do rabbits have long ears? There are two reasons. G give me, so think it over and talk, with, tell somebody sitting near you one reason you can think of that rabbits have long ears. Don't tell me, tell somebody near you. Two reasons why rabbits have big ears. One, to hear things. What in the wild in Ohio would like to eat a rabbit? You? No. Oh, coyotes, what else? Dogs, what else? Foxes, what else? Cats, what else? Pretty much everything that eats meat would just love to eat a tasty, crunchy, juicy little rabbit. Nom, 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 nom. Rabbits live in a continual and perpetual state of terror and alertness. A rabbit's life can best be defined as, oh my gosh, oh, no, oh, 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 ah! Because everything around them wants to kill them. This is not an easy way to live. Rabbits, if you notice that rabbits are a little bit jumpy, there's a reason for that. The rabbits that weren't jumpy are all dead. They're all coyote feces now. So, rabbits have big ears so that they can hear. Why else do rabbits have big ears? There's a second reason that rabbits have big ears. Okay, Grant. Cool to cool themselves down. Yes! It sounds crazy! How on earth do big ears cool down a rabbit? You guys were all laughing at him, weren't you? I heard you making fun of him. He's totally right. Do they use them as shade, little umbrellas? Do they fan one another with them? How do big ears cool rabbits down? Hmm, like a shade umbrella? Who here has seen a car? Not you have? Okay, Donovan, you're going to have some homework. It'll be easy to complete, though. So... In the front of the car, what's that big thing with green fluid in it? And the green fluid circulates. What is that thing? And you get a leak in it and it pees green fluid on the parking lot, it's a big problem. because you It's a radiator. Yeah, good. It's a radiator. Who here has ever seen a car radiator? Okay, what does a car radiator do? Cools the engine. If you don't have a radiator, your engine will overheat and your car engine will like fuse together into one molten block of metal. It's very bad. It will never, ever, ever run again. It can be done. So, the radiator cools off the fluid that's circulating around the engine because it's going through little tiny thin pipes and there's lots of wind hitting it. Guess what goes all through a rabbit's ears? Who here has ever seen a rabbit's ears up close? Who here has rabbit's has raised rabbits, has a friend who, or a neighbor who has raised rabbits. See, we need to bring a rabbit in here, don't we? This is what we need to do. We need to have a little house rabbit in here. Guess what runs all through that rabbit's ears? Blood vessels. Veins are one type of blood vessel. Yes. Blood vessels. And those blood vessels are running through some very thin tissue. They're not well insulated. And so the blood in those ears tends to cool down really, really fast. So 
have you ever seen a picture of a jackrabbit? I exaggerate a little. They've got much larger ears than our little eastern cottontail rabbits around here. Where do jackrabbits live? In the desert, in the southwest, in Texas, where it is hotter. So it's a species for whom having really, really, really big ears has been a big advantage. So they hear really well, and they cool off really well. Can you think of any place where having really, really, really big ears would be a disadvantage? Where? Where, Tyler? Okay, if it's really noisy, yeah. But rabbits are usually living out in like fields and woods and so noise probably isn't a huge issue, but maybe if you had like a rabbit in an urban environment. Okay, Dylan, you got one? Okay, where its ears stick up and it can't hide very well. Sawyer? Oh, like northern Canada where it's really, really cold. Haley, what were you going to say? Places where it's really cold. Yeah. So what might happen if you're living someplace where it's really, really, really cold and all that blood is out in your ears getting cooled off. You might, well, your ears might freeze. You might actually get frostbite of the ears, which can happen. Um, it might also cool your body temperature too much. You'd have to work really extra hard to keep your body temperature up because those ears would be cooling you off very efficiently. So, did anybody here, has anybody here actually raised rabbits? Okay, I raised rabbits in 4-H. 4-H rabbits. So you probably know this. Did you breed rabbits? Do you ever have, okay, that's rabbits three, I think, is breeding. Um, so you got to get a date for your bunny and take your bunny over and they do what bunnies do. And 31 to 33 days later, you have kits. You have little tiny baby bunnies. And they're not adorable at all. They're ugly and they're hairless and their eyes are closed and they have little stumpy ears. And for every breed of rabbits, if you're showing rabbits, there is a specified length, which is the correct length for your rabbit's ears. And if baby rabbits are born in the summer when it's really hot, guess what happens to their ears? What do you think? They, get, like, they actually get longer ears. So if you have a breed that's supposed to have really short ears and you have a, a litter that's born in the summer, you actually have to make sure that the stay, cage stays cool enough. Um, I had a litter born in the summer and we were freezing two liter bottles full of water and putting frozen two liter bottles in the cage with the mama and the babies to keep the cage temperature down because it was like August, she had her babies. And I'm desperately going, oh my gosh, I can't sell these rabbits if their ears are too long. Nobody's going to want to buy them because they won't show well. And they'll, you know, 4 H kids will like lose at barn judging and oh shoot. And so we were like, we had a rotation of, you know, six frozen two liter bottles and we'd put three in the freezer and put three in the cage and then a couple hours later swap them out and just to try to keep it down because if the temperature is too high, their ears get long. Remember, what were the two sources of variation we said? Me variation lab. Two sources of variation. Give me one. Inheritance. Inheritance. The genes you get, Cassandra. The environment. So if you've got a bunny whose genes said, well, yeah, you know, average size ears, but they're born when it's really, really hot, guess what the environment just did? Changed the distribution of this trait. What about rabbits that are born in the dead of winter? Little tiny baby bunnies born in January. It doesn't happen very often in the wild, but in domestic rabbits it can. What do you think would happen to their ears? They'd be much shorter. And that's, I also had a litter born in the middle of winter. We had to move the hutches into the garage. My mom was thrilled with that. We'll make little squiggly lines for shivering. That would tend to produce shorter eared rabbits. Really hot environment would tend to produce longer eared rabbits. So the environment can change the distribution of a trait. Now, we also, so there's, there's some happy medium. There's ears that are the right length to hear all the predators who really want to eat you, but aren't so long that in a place like Ohio that has a hard winter, or further north even, Michigan or Canada, 
your ears aren't going to be such a detriment to you because they're going to cool off your body so fast. So there are sort of these two forces at work, and so we end up with this sort of average ear length, and most rabbits have pretty average ears. We have a few rabbits with little tiny ears, like my little earless friend around my house. We probably have a few rabbits with crazy long ears. Maybe they don't survive as well. My, my little earless friend, I, I will say that I have snuck up pretty close to that little rabbit. And I think that that little rabbit's sense of hearing is not what it should be. Um, because it doesn't, how many of you have, okay, who here has been on a nature hike with anybody and done deer ears? Oh, we're going to do deer ears. I'm pausing the recording. So having those big sort of reflector dishes on the side of its head helps the rabbit hear predators coming. So what might happen that would shift that mode to having longer ears over a lot of generations? Let's look at that. So if we have this. Here's our normal distribution. This is rabbit ears. And let's say the tiniest rabbit ever measured had two centimeter ears and the longest eastern cottontail ever measured had nine centimeter ears. And most of them on average fall somewhere in here at, what would that be, probably like, let's see, 11, so about between five and six centimeters. Okay. If the climate got significantly warmer, well, actually, no, let's do cold. If the climate got significantly colder, if we had an ice age, so you understand that um, just north of us, the entire country was covered in glaciers about 10,000 years ago, big ice cubes, as my dad used to always say. They actually stopped in the middle of Columbiana County around Columbiana, Ohio, um, was the, the farthest advance of the most recent glaciers. So north of that, it's really flat. You get south of that, it's hillier. So let's say we get another ice age. Things get really cold, and they stay really cold. Where would you expect to see the mode, the high point, for rabbit ears after 30 years of really, really cold temperatures consistently? So here's what I want you to do. Point this way or this way. Which way is the mode going to move? Just use that because, okay. So you're all, you're all, okay, that's forward, Grant. So you think it's going to get bigger? I think it's going to get smaller. Are you being the scarecrow? <laughs> okay. The mode would probably shift down if it was really, really cold. Because what would happen to baby bunnies who got longer ears if the environment is so cold that now they're struggling? What happens if you, if you have really long ears and it's really cold? You have to take in more calories because you've got to keep yourself warm and your ears are doing a really efficient job of cooling you down. So the rabbits with longer ears would have to take in more calories for that reason. They also, you understand that the bigger your body is, the more calories you have to take in to maintain it. Did you know that? So somebody who is six foot three with the exact same frame and muscle to fat proportion and everything else, and somebody who is five foot three, the six foot three person has to eat more calories to maintain all of their body because there are more cells. So being small in size has some advantages. You don't need as many calories over the long term. Um, there's actually an island miniaturization effect, which we'll probably talk about at some point. There's also just having longer ears means more calories because you've got more cells. But there's also that you need more calories because you've got to fight to keep yourself warm. So over time, the mode would probably shift down. And then for a while, we would probably have, what kind of distribution is that green line? What is it? Skewed. Skewed. So we're going to say change in environment, cold, like the ice age. Over time, let me actually make that more clearly skewed. Over time, 
Do you know what would happen? Eventually, we go back to having a normal distribution in general. When something like that shifts, when the mode shifts, given enough time, we generally go back to having a normal distribution. It's just got a new normal. So now, at whatever point in the future this is, 100 years, 30 years, 50 years, rabbits breed pretty fast, your average rabbit's ears are more like three and a half or four centimeters. So we no longer have five to six as our average. We now have whatever, three, three and a half. It's badly drawn. But, um, and at that point, we probably can't find any rabbits with nine centimeter ears. Probably, they probably don't exist. That's evolution. That's all it is, is changing distributions. We talked about the example of humans getting taller over time. So, did we talk about that in this class? Who has ever seen a suit of armor? How could the average height, I mean this person, you know, maybe they're five foot six, big tough guy. How could the height of average humans in 500 years change that dramatically? Average human male in the US these days is five foot 10 inches tall, that is dead average. Five, five and a half or five, six, is dead average for a human female in the United States today. How could that change so much over time? So let's, let's draw a distribution here. So let's say here is, well, we'll, we'll, we'll make it go way out because, you know, are there two foot tall humans? Yes. Are there eight foot tall humans? Yes. Not a whole lot of them. Not a whole lot on either end. Average today, so let's see, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Hey, that's not bad. There's five foot, there's six foot. So average human male today is just under six feet tall. And it's probably more of a normal distribution, and it probably tapers off a lot more, actually, Because we don't get a lot of four foot tall guys either. But what we're saying is that 500 years ago, that average might have been here. Oops. What causes a shift like that? That was the first question somebody asked me in another class. How can that happen? So, how can that happen? How come somebody who's totally average, and I'm just dealing with men's heights because I have more information on that. Somebody who's a totally average guy today would be a giant 500 years ago, and somebody who's a totally average guy 500 years ago would be short by modern standards. How is this possible? Well, what are the two sources of variation? Environment and genetics. So one of two things is happening, and maybe both of them are happening. So either more tall people survive, find mates, and reproduce, and pass on their tall genes. Which, which one of the two sources would that be? Genetics. The other thing is environment. What about your environment influences how tall you get? Um, what, you eat. what you eat. Nutrition. Getting enough calories. Um, at the end of World War II, the winter of 1944 to 1945, the Dutch called the Starving Winter. Uh, most of the infrastructure of Europe had been decimated. Farm fields had been bombed. Um, there was very little food available for people. People starved. Pregnant women lost weight while pregnant and still carried babies to term. Um, you know, thousands, probably tens of thousands of people died of starvation and related causes. You can take siblings born three or four years apart. Children who were infants during the starving winter, or even toddlers who just, for, for basically a chunk of their early life, didn't get enough calories. 
and compare them to their siblings born a few years later who got adequate nutrition, and those kids who were starved early on are significantly shorter than their siblings who were not. So especially early nutrition matters a lot. Now, you all realize that this situation that we find ourselves in where there are more calories than we need is kind of a first in human history, right? You get that? You ever seen a fat wild animal? Very rarely. At the end of summer, you'll see fat groundhogs and fat bears. But overall, wild animals don't get enough calories, let alone too many. Humans, for most of human history, didn't get enough calories, let alone too many. Overweight was not an issue. Nobody was overweight. Nobody could get enough calories. That's why in the 1920s and 30s, like the Campbell, who's seen the historical Campbell Soup Kids? Like the, the, the image of healthy children was little fat children because everybody wanted their children to be fat because they were fighting against their children not getting enough calories. So the, the idea that your children could be chubby and have little chubby cheeks and little chubby bellies was so wonderful because who would think that your children could ever get too many calories? Like childhood obesity? Heck no. You know, give me fat kids because that means they're getting enough food. Well, through the Middle Ages, nobility would have eaten well most of the time, but most people didn't get enough food most of the time. They got just enough. They didn't get great nutrition. They, you know, their, their diet was lacking. And so as nutrition has improved, human heights have increased. We seem to have kind of, if, and it would be interesting to look at a graph. Um, I think that those gains in average human height have kind of tapered off, which would kind of mean that we've kind of reached the end of what environment can do. That, you know, okay, we're all getting enough calories now. This is about as tall as we can max out, um, except for genetic variation. So, Okay, tomorrow we are going to do a quiz on distributions and how they shift. And then we're going to move on to some evidence of evolution.